Imagine being cold and hungry with nowhere to eat. A park bench or subway is the only place that you could sleep. Life in a black bag, just a couple clothes and sheets. No one gives the time of day, let alone to stop and speak. Alcohol replaces conversations and it tastes so sweet. Say I'm antisocial. And now they try to label me. They say that Great Britain's great. Nothing ain't great to me. No matter what party wins, still no change for me. All good in summertime, wintertime, so cold and bleak. Said breaking an entry. Got arrested by the feds. At least I'm getting fed. Got a blanket and I got a bed. But it's only for the night. Next day getting bell. Back to this real world. Back to this life of hell. We commit petty crimes so we can go back to cells. Institutionalized. Life's better off in jail. And even though this ain't always the case, but it's a reality that a lot of people face. I'm Patch DeSalis, a young filmmaker from Bristol. After seeing a friend of mine end up on the streets in 2017, I've been on a journey over the last two years to find out more about this rising issue in Bristol, homelessness. Year on year, around the country, there are more and more people sleeping rough. On their 2017 survey, Bristol City Council counted 86 street homeless in one night. Homeless people I spoke to told me this is a big underestimation, missing out residential areas like Montpellier, Lawrence Weston, Fish Ponds, Barton Hill, Clifton. The first person I met through a local pastor was Simon. I knew I was going to be homeless, but I didn't know how long I was going to be homeless. I thought it was only going to be a short while but it ended up nearly two years, you know, and, and, and just hardly any help. I was living in Lawrence Weston at the time. Me and this girl used to get together, take drugs together as well, smoking heroin and crack. She was quite manipulative emotionally and psychologically. So after two years, I decided just to get out of there because if I didn't, I probably would have taught myself. People told me they'd become homeless through family crisis. Homelessness can happen to anyone. I became homeless because I couldn't get on with my mother at the time. And I had to leave the house for the sake of both of us. Oh, blood, it's hard to, like, I try to articulate it. Yeah, Yo, is it cool if I get a puff of that? Some people who you would never have thought would end up on the streets who got a, a family and a job, whatever, and then there's some crisis and um, they can't pay the rent, lose their home, and they end up on the streets. Could you introduce yourself to me, please, bro? My name's Troy. I'm uh, one of your local street homeless. You right, man? What's happening? You good? I'm alive, my man. Bless. Yeah, yeah, good, bless. My partner, she died. Um, I went through a lot of depression. Just gave up for myself everything around me. So recently, I decided if I want to keep my, my, my partner's memory alive, I've got to keep myself alive and sort my shit out. Okay. Uh, bro, I've got loads, but You're thank okay. you still. Don't okay. Please don't take it as me, so thank you still. Okay. Have a good day, yeah? You too, man. Bless, man. I, I basically done four years on the streets, hardcore. And, uh, now I come out, I come out the other end a lot stronger, and with some new skills. <laughs> you know, my communication skills have actually improved. Whereas before, I used to be quite nervous talking to people. I waffle bullshit all day long, and like I always say, shit's fertile. <laughs> stay strong, stay happy, man. You know what I mean? One day it'll all come to an end. You know what I mean? Whether it be by death or by your situation changing. Remember, the only thing that's different about you, you know what I mean, is that you don't have a roof. Everything else is the same. Hello. My name's Troy. Troy, I'm Linda. Nice to meet you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Nothing is going right. Nothing is going right.
Homelessness is not just about personal or family issues. Government policy has a part to play. But what we are seeing in Bristol now, and it, it has been, it, it's accelerating, is, is the, the growth of alternative ways of existing that come from a lack of proper housing. So in parks, you see tent colonies. In the streets, you see people living in vans. You see people living in caravans. Uh, because of the ever-increasing cost of housing and the shrinking of the safety net, we are seeing more and more street people. This made me think what Bristol is doing for our homeless. St Mungo's Charity is a place that supports the homeless through creative expression. St Mungo's is a charity which helps primarily homeless people and what we try to provide is a positive outlook. Hope it, it will give them some uh, confidence to go forward with their lives. See that there is a way through the tunnel. There is actually light at the end of the tunnel. My name is Edward William Wilhelm Scott II. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> no, yeah, Edward Scott. And why are you here today, Eddie? Because I really like it. It's fun. You know, I, uh, I come here because I enjoy myself. It's funny enough, I don't really talk about homelessness in here. My name's Phil, and I used to be homeless a few years ago. I'm not homeless anymore. Thank you very much to, um, you know, all the people around me, all the agencies that have been helping me out. Dragged me out of the gutter, you know, dragged me out of my sleeping bag. Nice warm sleeping bag. It was possibly through a breakdown of a marriage, maybe, and uh, the use of too much drink, maybe, because of it. Some mungos, you know, and the art group, you know, helped me get my confidence back, get back into creativity. I did this uh, little painting here, uh, which kind of represents, uh, like, the opposites, dark, you know, like, nighttime, daytime. <coughs> what do you say the homeless situation in Bristol is like? It's pretty dire, it's pretty bad, because we're all facing, like, major austerity. I was homeless about five years ago, because um, <clears throat> I was with, a, like, an abusive guy, basically, and I had to run away from him. I sought somewhere out to live within, like, a week. Bristol's, like, the most helpful city I've ever been in. But before that, I was homeless for, like, six months, getting in some pretty bad situations with drugs and, and, and yeah, just everything you can imagine, really. Music's really the one thing that's kept me going. A friend of mine, Niall, also found music essential when he was homeless. While on the streets, one of his few possessions was his old laptop, giving him the means to make music. For Niall, moving on from homelessness meant throwing that laptop away. I threw that laptop in the sea, you know. Oh, I just was like, oh, let me dash you figure away. Like, from the past, like, let's put to bed all the hurt and all the, all the like, self, um, yeah, like, what's the word? What's the word for it? <laughs> yeah, self-pity, people sorry for yourself. I just wanted to dead that. It's a random story. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It's yeah. nice <laughs> right now I'm 20, and the first time I was homeless, I was 17. And then after that, the second time, I was 18. 17, yeah, it wasn't nice, but it was almost like a little vacation for me. Um, when you're 18, and then the way they see you, if you look in the mirror, you don't see yourself as some grown-ass man, but to, to the council and to people, it's like, you're an adult now. You need to sort stuff yourself. It's Pete, you're in a situation, but we can't do nothing. It was way more brutal, because it was like, I, I, there was no support, other than the couple friends I had, I was um, sofa surfing, and then you can't stay at someone's yard forever. The girl I was with, I couldn't like be around the family all the time, it was embarrassing, because they didn't want your, um, your daughter to be with a guy who's like, has nowhere to go, and I've questioned the situation as well, because it was a family situation, and you're thinking, like, you know, questioning who you are, if you're a good person to be around, when someone's in the council, they just didn't want to hear none of it. They were just like, I was begging them, they were like, well, you were in it once, you really think we're gonna give you a place a second time? After that, then I got into the youth hostel by begging and begging and begging. It was like horrible, it was quite like humiliating, trying to beg, just to be like, please, can you give me somewhere to stay? It's the longer you stay in that environment, the more it changes you, because I blatantly saw myself change. Like, I was becoming cutthroat. I was, like, contemplating doing things I wouldn't do before. You know what I mean? I wasn't raised up like that. If someone can literally be transported from, like, a, a you know, a bad or okay background, they're, they're okay, they're in an all right area, to so suddenly now 
being in an environment where you're surrounded by that and suddenly they're doing things which they wouldn't have even contemplated before. Then I had a situation at the youth hostel where one of the kids was just being racist, Islamophobic, um, everything, like just being, like saying the most like ignorant shit antagonizing me and I couldn't get away from it because you're stuck in this environment. And I ended up in a situation in a cell and I was um, then with police. Part in its wider sense, it seems to me, is a, a method of discussing issues. A real role in addressing many of the problems and, and holding uh, truth to power, call, calling governments to account. So under such institutions as I'm doing an interview. All right there, folks. Uh, my name's Simon, um, Simon Dagger, and I'm the proprietor and owner of Dagger's Rough Cuts, DRC. Some of you in Bristol may recognise me because uh, I'm out here nearly day in, day out. I make and sell jewellery and crystals in order just to make some money to basically enjoy the same freedoms that everybody enjoys. You know, like food, fun, beer, and toothpaste, and all that shit, man. Yeah. Maybe a little weed. <laughs> so, as you can see in my tray, there's a lot of stuff here made out of recycled wire. What I'm going to do right now is I'm going to make a uh, little musical note. <laughs> I did my best to keep clear of everyone else. So I like I go to, I'd stay in places where it was very it was quite visible for other people. Like so I you know like not bad what happened in it. I wasn't dealing with crack or anything, like the hard drugs in it. Like if you're dealing with those hard drugs, you're gonna meet people within that like industry in it. So you're gonna get involved in that. A common link to homelessness is drugs. Through speaking to dealers and to addicts, I found out more. What do you think is the relationship between homelessness and drugs? I would say, I don't know, that addiction, more time people don't find what to do. There's, there's some people just use it to just to stay up the whole night, basically, you know what I'm saying? Most of them are addicted, innit? Most of them are had houses, everything, council are doing stuff for them, giving them money, everything, but they just got nothing to do with it, just use it on that. So what are we doing here, Patch? Basically, yeah, we're trying to find out a link between homelessness and drugs. So if we were to speak to someone who can actually show us more. Purchase um, some A-class drugs. I bought some crack cocaine, yeah, a 10 ball of crack cocaine and a 10 ball of heroin. Don't do drugs. <laughs> and I mean that. I'm saying that from experience. This is this just to get one of the lanes that you come into using drugs? The long one, elongated, just there, that is your brown, that's your heroin. That is one of the most more dangerous and the more addictive substances. And that is a 10 bag wrapped in Rizla, as you can see. It's a powdery substance in a paper pack. And here's what your heroin looks like. It's a brown powdery substance. It can become, it can come a little bit darker than this, or it can come a lighter than this. This is a 10 bag. This will hold someone for eight hours before they start re uh, start um, plucking. This one is your crack cocaine. It's wrapped in plastic. Let's get like that. It's wrapped in plastic, yeah? It will come as a white lump or a yellowy lump. Sometimes you get pink. But that's just like um, food coloring drops on it. But if you know anyone that's trying to encourage you to use this stuff, yeah, and you've never used it before, Think twice about your friendship. That is your rock, 10 pound rock. This gives you a high, speeds everything up, and your body will be quite tight. 
The brown is what they used to come down on to chew, chew out. People use them for different reasons, yeah. Basically, they're using them for self-medication. They have issues, mental issues, emotional issues, which they use them for. Yeah, so there's your two. Your crack cocaine and your heroin. It's like they don't see, they don't worry about the facts It was just me, my brother Ollie and it's mad Cause I'm seeing how this shit will ruin lives first hand But we ain't focused on that Too busy pointing our hands when it's not that Should I state the reason why? Cause you and me tonight will get to sleep just fine When lovers they are bluffing on the streets at night And then we wonder why they're fucking with the bees and why Guess it's to numb the pain, spoke to one brother today Trying to get his life back but it's all gone straight It's so cold and the dark takes the shudders away So I won't bloody complain cause we got to blame, yeah Mr Johnson mate No it's not solely you But I struggle to think what you on your own can do You put your hopes in troops, I'm funding soldiers too When stability that's something building homes could do So while drug use can tip you into being homeless I can see how living on the streets can turn one to drugs Numbing the pain emotionally and physically I'm Simon, I'm with Patch and Kian Just gonna take a little tour of my um, home and places of residence over the last 10, 11 months. So there's just the two of us here, and we stayed here for about six or seven of the months. We stayed right through the bad... It was that winter in 2017 with the beast from the east and the weather bombs. So we stayed here throughout the snow. And, like, big up to the local residents who came and bought us cups of tea. There were, like, three or four of them, you know, it didn't... Didn't go unnoticed. I decided to move up a little bit further into the wood. It comes into the Avon Valley and the Froome River, and that's where we are in Bristol. And then on the other side of that hill, that's the Chew Valley, and that's where I'm from originally. I built this place for like a good four months, so you know, so I really like this place. But before they asked me to move and I had to take everything down, there was like three tomato plants here. There are three leeks here, six onions here, and then um, two courgette plants here. Here was where my tent was. And behind it, along the fence, I cut along so you could like uh, keep a bike underneath that hedge. There's like a garage and then, like a shed, so I also kept wood in it. I used to have a shower dangling off of this cherry tree. There used to be a shower in it. So, yeah, it was pretty complete, man. It's pretty complete. This is it, this is the entrance. This is the entrance, man. Sorry, dude. This is the thing that used to be in my couch. And you can see it's like a storage thing as well. Good old Brandon. They paid us to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I keep a couple of gardening tools when I can get some work, you know, if I can get any gardening work, you know. So I've got like hoes, uh, different area codes. <laughs> my tent's been done over so many times since I've been here, but I know such is life. And this is home, I feel comfy, comfy enough here. I feel safe enough here. Like, I definitely feel a lot safer than I would do if I was in like a hostel or something. But I'd rather just work my way out of it myself. Like, um, had enough of waiting, so we just kind of got to do the things that we need to do ourselves right now, you know, which is make our own housing, make our own funds, you know? Like, you know, I make jewelry and stuff and that's how I like, sustain myself. Yeah. <laughs> Even in a wealthy area like Clifton, Simon could not feel safe. I used to go to this church. Um, on a Sunday morning when I was homeless. Sometimes we would sleep around here just to get away from the, um, uh, from the road. I didn't have too much trouble up here, but there was one time there was about six guys. One of them wanted to stab us. Uh, next thing I knew, a policeman came along and said, oh, somebody's got something to say to you. And this guy apologised and said, look, uh, we were thinking of stabbing you, but it wasn't me, it was my mate. 
I went, oh, all right, that's, well, thank you for the apology, you know. This is where I, um, sorry, slept. I made sure I was pretty warm. I had duvets, I had sleeping bags, air beds. Right here, yeah? Yeah. Always keep yourself safe, always keep yourself warm. As well as Tyndall's Baptist, Simon was supported by the congregation at Woodlands Church, sometimes sleeping in the shed. And I had about eight or nine families come forward saying that they wanted to help me. That was really great, you know. And it just made me happy. It wasn't ne necessarily about having somewhere to lay my head. It was the fact that people had come forward and wanted to help. That's what really touched me, you know. So, yeah, I used to read that from time to time. Give me a bit of comfort, you know, which it did. Young people, they're, they're hidden. They're there, but you're not going to see them unless you really looked. You did a documentary like this. <laughs> As a pride thing, you don't want to be caught, like, um, in this environment. You don't want to be caught lacking. Like, it's embarrassing. A lot of people would be embarrassed, man. They'll be out doing something at either a yard or something else like that and just stay out the whole night sort of thing. So, like, they're not blatantly... You're not going to see them here right now being... Like, or, like, with a blanket or whatever, or with, um, you know, like a typical homeless scenario where you just see them on the street. Like, it's not like that. With young people, because... Yeah, I feel like you have to get to a certain point to really have the pride to be asking someone... I've never been there myself, but from my... from what I'm seeing, it's like you'd have to be in a certain um, frame in your head to be able to be, like begging someone for money, because I feel like that's quite a crushing thing. Like, you'd have to have your spirit crushed to really be like, you know, I'm going to have to ask some random person on the shoes could just, you know, say the rudest thing to me or look at me like a piece of dirt. I, myself, don't won't give people money, like, mostly because I don't have the money. I'm still on benefits and I have a young child. But I think the best way to help people is accessing resources in Bristol. Don't give up. Be persistent with um, like homeless shelters. Like if you need somewhere to stay, turn up there every single day, be there on time. Like you don't give them any reason not to kick you out. Listen to the people who are in the, in the whole organisations who are giving advice, because there are people who do want to help. And you just, I know you got to really feed, like, ah, beg it from them, but, like, you're not going to, they're not going to give you what you want unless you ask. You've got to want to, like, change your situation. The girl I used to be with passed away. She was murdered. And, like, the main thing which kept me going was, like, how how can I be, like, crumble now when there's people whose lives have been taken away from them? Consistent hope. You need to have a concept that there might just be something better. As soon as you come at somebody with judgment and criticism, you'll shut everything down. When I've been on the street, the most thing that was helpful to me is when somebody... Um, just came o come, come over and just sit down and speak to us. You know, I found that really helpful out of anything, you know. What's worse than being homeless? Living like you ain't got no focus. What's worse than being homeless? Like you ain't got no hope left. What's worse than being homeless? Living like you ain't got no focus. Uh, what's worse than being homeless? What's worse? A few months later, I met back up with Simon Dagger. No longer summer, Simon had left his tent and was staying in a squat through the cold winter months. The people there are decent, but at the end of the day, we're all kind of... Yeah, like the lost boys, <laughs> I guess you could say. Simon told me how he became homeless in the first place. I was out in Vietnam and I was an English teacher. I suffered the loss of a friend. It froze you back a bit. And after that, I came back to the UK. And the UK had changed a lot, man. Two years, brother. You know, it's all changed. The benefit system, though, more importantly. How do you feel about, like, everything right now? 
Like, I've tried, man. Like, it's not feasible. Once you drop so far below the mark, you look dirty, your nails aren't clean, you ain't got slacks, you're not wearing a belt. So, how can you get a job, you know? You got the will, you got the spirit, but at the end of the day, they break it down. And at the end, there's only so much that you can give. And at the end of the day, they'll probably beat you, man. Because I... I ain't going... Uh, like, yeah, man, it's too much, man. It's too much. It breaks it down. Where are we now? We're at uh, Places for People, and this, and I've just moved into this um, the shared house. Um, yeah, from the Salvation Army. I moved about three weeks ago. So, um, yeah. So here it is. Here's my room, it's a bit small. It's quite cute. <laughs> so, so here I am. My cute little room. <laughs> From the moment I left my flat in Lawrence Western and my girlfriend, two years, seven months, it's taken me to get to this point here now. I came off the street after about 18, 19 months and then uh, I went into the Sally Army. The, the damage that the streets can do to you in, in such a little time is, is, is a lot, you know. I might paint a bad picture about it, but sometimes it's like that, sometimes it isn't. It depends who you are. Get your head down, you know, don't get into any trouble, and you could be in a place like this. <laughs> yeah. Patch, you've been on this journey with me as well, mate. So I really appreciate you um, uh, filming this and getting this out to the people. What's, it, what's the journey been like for you? Um, I've learned a lot. I've been blessed by people like yourself to be like put in these environments and hopefully show what's going on. I didn't understand so much before and I think people need to gain an understanding and take out the judgment. Thank you, Patch, for sharing the journey with me. Bless Simon. Bless you, brother. Oh, bring it here, bro. Bless, man. Yeah. Gear, oh, you know what that was? <laughs> <laughs> that was the perfect way to end it, man. They say be the change that you want to be. But if you see no hope, then what do you want from me? Outside's kind of cold and I just want some sleep. Me and my sleeping bag, I just want some heat. We live in fantasy, reality, it doesn't sell. That's a typical imbalance that's upon the scale. Stay focused on the trap, trying not to derail. Putting hard work, graph, I'm trying to excel. They say failing to plan, planning to fail. Replace life stress with toxins that I inhale. Imagine prison in your mind, living in a cell. We live on hell on earth because we living in hell. Vanity and greed seems to be the only thing that prevails. Can't jump aboard the boat once the ship set sails. My point of views and my truths is cold harbour tells. Words are more than words, the chants and spells. Thoughts and feelings, aspirations, my fears as well. My biggest fear in life, living to fail. This ain't living. Well, we're out here in Rainy Somerset, which is where I've now got my caravan. I got a job and, you know, things have got better. And I've just got one message for anyone who's watching this. It, it takes a long time and it's not an easy journey. You know, you have to work hard and there are times that they grind you down. And like, there's times when you give up, and it definitely happened to me. I felt the lowest and the highest, like you know, over this like whole journey. But it can be done. You know, there's a lot of people out there who I hope can take message, take strength from this. That there is light at the end of the tunnel, man. You know, and like Patch has been following me. We've been hanging out for two years doing this, and it's not, it's not a quick fix, and it's not an easy journey. But yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say, man. No one's gonna help you if you don't help yourself. 
I stood at the end of the day. No, one, no one's gonna help you. Yeah, go and volunteer. Uh, stop and speak to a homeless person. People out there who I hope can take message, take strength from this, that there is light at the end of the tunnel, man, you know? There's so many different people on the streets for so many different reasons, so you shouldn't judge one person by another. Do we live in a situation where the top 1% owns more than half of all the world's resources? It's nuts. You know, you are right to be angry. You should be really angry. Not all of us buy do the basics you need to do to survive but you shouldn't be surviving you should be living so